All right, Rilo, thank you for joining us. I'm very welcome to join you all. So tell me about your upbringing. My upbringing, I come from a community called The Bluff in Atlanta. It has the highest crime rate in Atlanta. And um, it was a, I wouldn't say it was a rough childhood because it was abnormal to us because that's where we were from and that's how we knew. I started selling drugs at a young age. Before I was selling drugs, I was selling CDs, bootleg CDs and DVDs from the um, Africans at the African shop. I'd get them for a dollar and 25 cents and go sell them for probably three, sometimes two for a five. And then um, I started selling drugs. I got into the drug business real heavy. And then after I stopped selling drugs, I started rapping. I invested my money in rap. Now you said it's dangerous where you grew up, right? So what, did you ever like decide to, to do something different, veer away from the dangers? I wouldn't say, the only, only reason why I'm saying it's dangerous now is because I go other places and I start like getting familiar with other people and their lifestyle, you know what I'm saying? Cause it wasn't dangerous to me because it was just normal. It mm -hmm. was just the thing to do. It was just everyday life. Mm -hmm. So when I when I got older, as I grow older and I start living in other different places and places in Atlanta and start going to the subdivisions and suburbs and stuff, I start to notice like this ain't what's going on everywhere. Mm -hmm. Now there's that Netflix movie, and I know you've probably been asked this a hundred times, mm -hmm. but like Snow the Bluff, right? I, I actually just tr tried to look at that movie like the day before yesterday. I never seen that movie before. Uh huh. It, I never seen it because um, I know the dude that actually shot the movie. You know what I'm saying? That he wasn't doing a robber. Mm -hmm. He never was a robber. Yeah. So I couldn't write, really get in tune to it because he my partner. Right, right. Is you, do you think it's an ac accurate depiction of of the area? No, ma'am. I actually think that um, in the bluff, it's more so of hustling, like drug dealing. A lot of narcotics being sold um, with the heroin capital of America. You know what I'm saying? Like, the bluff was the heroin capital of the world. I mean, for of America for approximately seven or eight years. Mm -hmm. So, more so, it wasn't a lot of robbery going on. It was more so of a lot of hustling, a lot of drug dealing. Mm -hmm. And, like, where I came from, my dad and my people didn't teach me to rob. Right. So. And your father was much <clears throat> older than your mother. Yes, ma'am. So, I mean, what did he instill in you, like, as as far as um, he as far as he lived, you know? Him and I wasn't really close at all. Mm -hmm. I really didn't ever have a a father figure in my life. He had a, um a lot of money from my ages of one to probably about eight years of age. Mm -hmm. He went broke after that. And you know, once the old head go broke, once the sugar daddy go broke, he's not useful. Mm -hmm. So he wasn't useful anymore more and my mama kept him to the curve. Mm -hmm. So after that, I really didn't see him no more. And um, probably when I was about 12, 13 years of age, he had passed away. What was his occupation? His occupation was kingpin drug dealer. Mm -hmm. He was kingpin, he had, he made a lot of money, but you know, as you get 60, 70 years old, it, it, it just ain't no point in hustling like that no more. Mm -hmm. He was hustling all his life, so. Do you think you followed in his footsteps, like, because he was a kingpin? I, I mean, yes, I mean, because I was around the people, and all his clientele knew me as his son, so it was like, it almost chose you. And it all, it's just chose me because they were just waiting for me to get some dope to supply them with. So as I grow older, the clientele was already attached to me because they basically raised me. Like we stayed in the same household all these years and like they rode the bike with me. They was my babysitter, they was my nanny. And when it was time for me to step up to the plate, it was more so of a relationship than just business. Like, it wasn't really, more importantly, being a consumer. Like, we had a bond. In another interview, you referred to your mom as, uh, well, your mother and father's relationship as like a sugar daddy, um, sugar baby relationship. Yes, that's, that's correct. Um, my mother was probably around 30, 32 years of age when I was born. 
And um, my father was like 52, 53 years old, so he had her about 20 some years or whatnot. And um, she basically will tell you that. And my mother, like, she real heavy on money, like, like she need her money. So she, I'm her sugar daddy right now. So she real strong on that. Like, she came from that era where men took care of women, you know. Towards nowadays, like, the women seems to be taking care of the man nowadays. So how does your mom feel about you calling her um, sugar baby? It wasn't um, until I got to the point in the age that I'm in now and I see younger females or females of my generation doing the same thing that she did that wrong the bell up and put the light in my head. You know what I'm saying? So it ain't no secret. You know what I'm saying? It's, it's very obvious. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? I learned. I'm older now and I see what was really going on. Because mm -hmm. he was, I always wanted to know you know how you go to school and they have father and son day? I didn't really want to bring my father to school because he was so old. And everybody else's father was young, you know what I'm saying? And then at that time and period when it was time to go to father and son days, he was broke by then, you know what I'm saying? So he he wasn't able to keep himself up and it almost would be embarrassing, you know what I'm saying? Everybody father looking all nice and neat and Father, son, licking the light, and him and I was never able to do that mm -hmm. because we was in two different whole worlds. You know what I'm saying? He was not only old, but he was from Mississippi. And, you know, by him being from Mississippi, he was, like, kind of late on fashion and stuff like that. Very late. And he was old, so he kind of messed up the whole thing. When you got out, um, well, even before you got out, you know, did you ever feel bad about selling drugs to people, people that you grew up with? And then, not only that, you, you know, you said your mother did cocaine. So, did you ever supply her with your own supply? I was the biggest drug dealer in the bluff for a, a, large, a long period of time. I had the bluff and I had Simpson. Like, they, they like two different neighborhoods almost, but they're in the same area. And I was the biggest drug dealer over there, so I had the best quality drugs, and I also had large quantity for a lower price, you know what I'm saying? So I was out being all my competition around the way. So she snuck and bought drugs from me, because I wasn't never in there. Like I said, I had all my dudes that grew up with me, and we just we just built this big empire, a drug empire. And um, she used to sneak. I used to help out of sneaking, you know what I'm saying? sending other people like my brothers and stuff like that to buy the powder because he do powder too. So I knew when he came, she, he was coming for her also. And it kind of like, it kind of hurted me a lot. You know what I'm saying? It hurted me a whole lot. But when you come from that era, like, you don't feel like nothing wrong with it. Like, mm -hmm. the things that I do when I shot people or when I shoot people or the thing that I did to Rich Homer Kwan, I ain't feel like it was a bad thing to do because that's what we did all our life. So a person that ain't seen that and ain't used to that, they'll think it's wrong. But when you raised up, that's all you know. If your mama teach you Spanish and you from America, you only know Spanish. Mm -hmm. You don't feel like your know, teacher tell you at school you need to know English. You like, no, nah. you smell me. So that's all I knew. So I ain't never felt like it was wrong until like around now. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And I still have trouble nowadays feeling that it's wrong. Yeah. Did did she stop using? No, she never stopped using. She still uses it to this day. Do you want to send her to rehab? I try my best to do everything by my mama. I bought her a house. I bought her a car. I even try to pay her uh, allowance every week to stop. And she she just refused to stop. All right. She drank real heavy, too. And, um, like, more so... That was like the hardest part of my life dealing with her, because after the money gone and and niggas went when when things start changing when niggas stopped taking care of females, like it kind of got rough for her because niggas stopped going for that. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And she was so disabled she she just didn't know how to go get her own money. 
she was so spoiled. Like, I want, I wanted to go to school. Like all my life, I wanted to graduate from school. It's just something that I personally had going on, and just to hear the music six, five, four o'clock in the morning every morning, like can't get no rest, cause she ended up getting high with her friends and drinking, and they playing loud music, and to go in there and tell mama I'm ready to go to school in the morning, and she tell yo, hey, if you want to be grown, get the fuck out of my house. So like, you want me, baby, you want me to get the fuck out your house, so. I got the fuck on. And you how old were you then? I was like 12, 11, 12 years old. So where'd you go? Shit. When I left, she, she wasn't able to take care of herself either. You know what I'm saying? Because it wasn't even her house. It was like my grandma's house and stuff like that. So it wasn't even her house. So we didn't really have nowhere to sleep in there. You know what I'm saying? You sleep wherever it was room to sleep at. You know mm-hmm. what I'm saying? So it wasn't never her house. And once you leave your mama's house, you don't want to go back. It's like a pride issue after that. Mm-hmm. Like, I can't go back. Even when I did lose my spot, I got me an apartment. I mean, I got me a hotel. I went broke in the hotel just because I didn't want to go back home. Now, how did you stray away from, um, I mean, did you ever use drugs? No, or, no. So how did you stay away from all that? She motivated me. I looked at her and I said to myself, how the hell is she doing me? I will never do that to a person. So she was my motivation. Mm-hmm. And still to this day, I never drunk a piece of alcohol. I never did no drug. I never smoked a blunt or a cigarette, no tobacco or nothing. My entire life, and she is the cause of that. Cause I said I would never do no shit like that. The mm-hmm. things that she did to me, I never do nobody like that. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's amazing because it's like you're in this now. You're in this like celebrity lifestyle. Not only that, before then, you know, you kind of were a celebrity on you know, right in your neighborhood. Mm-hmm. Um, that would trigger my success to be so big because I was already like a celebrity in the neighborhood. Right. So, okay. Um, let's talk about your name, Rilo. Where did that come from? Um, around, around, around the ages of um, 11 and 12, I, like I said, I was selling CDs, bootleg CDs and DVDs. And it's this dude, this the dude that actually the first person that, you know what I'm saying, told me that my mama do drugs. I never knew until he told me. He told me one day, he said, you know me and your mama be snout potty, you know we get high. I looked at his ass. I ain't want to tell him, like, I ain't know. So I was like, yeah, I know, bro, I know. I know. So it was this dude named Mario, a.k.a. Rollo. He told me this. His name was Jermaine Davis, and my name is Terrell Davis, so it seemed like he was an angel to me. So, um... It was a long journey with him and I, you know what I'm saying? I used to go out and sell CDs. I used to make money. So my mom and him together, they both snout the powder, so that shit didn't mix. So nobody kept each other up. They brung each other down more so. So when we lost our house, we um, moved in some apartments called Dixie Hill. It's up the street off Simpson Road in Atlanta. And he just asked me one night, he pride, he got it pride out of the way. He was like, man, I'm fucked up. I ain't had no money in so long. Your mom keeping me down. And I used to hear him talking on the phone to his brothers and sisters, like, they whole keeping me down. But that my mama. My mama is the whole you talking about. So I ain't agreeing with that. You smell me. So I'm like, I used to hear him because I used to be like quiet as hell. And he know I would hurt him. So he was like, man, I need to get right, man, so I can get out of this shit, bro. I ain't he had went broke because when he first came around, he had money or whatnot. So he asked me, like, man, hey, Terrell, let me um, borrow some money. I need to buy me a quarter. A quarter slab was like 125 back then. So I let him borrow some money out of my CD money, which was $125. And he went out in a whole new neighborhood. He don't know nobody in and tried to come up and hustle. They robbed him and killed him. And he ain't never robbed him. So when he killed him, he just touched my heart so much. He revealed that my mom did drugs and revealed the streets to me, the struggle, and taught me so much stuff. And he prepared me for the challenges that I was finna come up to. And I just kept his name. Mm-hmm. Are you close with his, with his family? I ain't know nobody in his family. Damn. How old was he? <laughs> my mom was actually his sugar mama. He was 23. <laughs> At age, he was 23, 24 years old. And you were cool with that? 
Shit, that nigga was so real. You know mm-hmm. what I'm saying? You know how somebody walk in the room and you just know you don't fuck with them. Like, you ain't feeling they vibe. Like, damn, I need to get away from that person. He was just one of the people that me and him, him and I clicked. He walked in the room, it just felt his spirit like it just was some genuine shit, some mm-hmm. real shit. You know what I'm saying? And I loved it, you know what I'm saying? He like the first nigga I ever fell in love with. You said you shot at like about 20, 30 people. And how did that how did that make you feel as far as like you just dealt with the death of your friend? And were you worried about like it being that close to being your story? I never feel death. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? It was almost to a point in my life where I wanted to be dead. You know what I'm saying? Like, I wasn't going to kill myself. But I had felt so used. I've been feeling so used my whole life because I got a good heart and I take care of a lot, a lot of people. So it was to the point where like, I ain't never gave a fuck about getting killed. It was just... I mean, it might sound kind of careless, it might sound crazy, but that's how I always felt. I always been prepared for it. That's why I tried my best to do so much good, because I know what God got a place for me. You know what I'm saying? I've, I, I've done, I kept it real. It's mm-hmm. mine. So if you keep it real, it's the only one place you can go. So how did you move? Did you move like by, by yourself or a big team? I moved. I moved. To this day, with a large team, you know what I'm saying? I got us some apartments. I bought the whole complex so everybody can have their own individual spot and they still can have their kids and stuff like that. Like, I I, I think as a team, I never thought about myself, you know what I'm saying? Whatever I get, I make sure large quantities of people can live in that place, you know what I'm saying? I had a mansion before I did this, and it had 13 bedrooms in it, but I made sure all of us be together, like, when we die, I want, we're gonna die together. Right. So, at some point, um, in another interview, you talked about you made $12 million in one year. Right. Right? So, how did that come about, and, you know, how is, how can you hide $12 million? <laughs> I wasn't, I, I actually made 12, right? Because I was counting how much money I had made. Mm-hmm. But I only had, like, three. I only, Jewelry and cars and and clubs and that shit, clothes, jacket, like, like. If you make a million dollars, you gonna spend probably like three hundred thousand, four hundred thousand, just making it mm-hmm. on everyday life. Like, even if you taking your girl out to the to the restaurant, it costs money to, for the gas for like. So, I just was counting my profits I made. You know what I'm saying? And I still was like spending money at the same time, but every time I made money, I just checked like $750,000, $750,000, 750000 mm-hmm. So it got up to like 15 times, 20 times. And I noticed like, damn, I made $12 million. Right. Where the hell it went? You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. So it's it's easy to have. It's easy to spend it. <laughs> and it's easy to invest in, especially when you start investing in real estate and things of that matter. Like, ain't no limit to how much money you can spend on real estate. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? Ain't no limit to how much money you can spend, period. So. So let's talk about your relationship with Young Scooter. At some point, you went, you were homeless and you were staying with him. Right. So how right. did your friendship come about? Um, I actually went to school with his little brother. His name Kyrie Broughton. You know what I'm saying? They call him K Blocker, Black Amigo K Blocker. And um, him and I was best friends in school. You know what I'm saying? He knew what I was going through, and I spent a night of his house. So actually, Scooter was always the big brother. He was like two, three years older than us at all times. So when um, K Blocker, he moved back to South Carolina. He got in a lot of trouble, you know what I'm saying? So he been in jail. He just been in jail more than me. I was just able to get blessed and get out. So when I got out of prison this last time, he was so happy that I got out. You know, Scooter was so happy, so he came to my apartments. I had some apartments I had rented out like seven or eight units called Ashby Park. We called them bricks. And um, he came and see me one day, and he was telling me he was rapping. And I was like, shit, I want to rap too. And, you know, he just gave me his full support. I didn't even know you could charge people for features. And now that I charge 5000 a feature, 
I just think back at him and I was like, damn, he gave me all them features for free. He gave me three, four features for free and did the videos. And you know, the video costs even more. Mm -hmm. And he did everything for me, you know what I'm saying? And I just been so thankful for him doing those things, hooking me up with Future and stuff like that. And we just got real, real close and I feel like I owe him the world. Right. And you even have, you paid Future for features before, right? For the deals and stuff. Right. Um, Future, you know, he he been on fire, you know yeah. what I'm saying, since he stepped in the door, you know what I'm saying, he been on fire. And um, I was trying to drop a mixtape, and Young Scooter was telling me, like, you need to um, get you a single. And I was like, what the hell is a single? It was like a song that um, that you can concentrate on to get in the clubs and get on the radio. I'm like, All right, I got a lot of them. And he was like, nah, you got to get one that everybody going to like, guaranteed. Like, I was like, everybody like me. He was like, nah, this is the whole world you talking about. I'm thinking about my neighborhood, so I said, man, that nigga Future got a lot of songs on the radio. I was like, tell him, give me a hook. <laughs> he was like, all right. He said, he gonna charge you though, bro. I was like, what he want? It was like, uh, he want 25000 So I was like, shit, what is that? Call him, tell him I need a feature. Um, he gave me a feature, and, and while we were doing the feature, he started like, Future started, like, he, he was hearing about me anyway. Of course, I ran in Atlanta. And then he started, like, like loving me, started getting closer and closer to me. And when he got closer and closer to me, it just, it just, we just clicked. You know what I'm saying? We came, we became closer to him in Scooter. You mm -hmm. know what I'm saying? And you said that they took you seriously once they saw you at Vine Jewelry. <laughs> yeah, you know, the crazy thing, and, and that was Future. That how Future knew who I was in the studio, cause I already had started buying jewelry. Cause Scooter's giving me the recipe to the game. Like, gotta buy jewelry, gotta get a singer, you gotta get this, you gotta get that, you gotta get this. And that was the number one thing he told me. And I was like, shit, I ain't know when you go in these country towns, that what all the country people want to see, the jewelry and shit like that. So I started buying jewelry. I started buying a whole lot, the qualities, Rolexes and diamonds that you can get from the Diamond District, which is here in New York. And um, people started noticing, like, who the hell is that buying all that jewelry? And it kind of, like, put my put me on the scale. Nobody didn't even know I had the money that I had until I started buying that jewelry. Mm -hmm. So when you go seeing a dude with a $100,000 chain on, and you know this is the same chain Birdman got on, what the hell he doing with that chain? And it just started making a lot of noise. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Now, how'd you get into rap? I got into rap. Um, I used to be in prison, and um, I used to listen to the radio, and I couldn't just listen to these niggas because they was talking about killing, shooting. And I know I got a life sentence over my head, and I'm like, man, they can't be, they can't be, they can't be talking about this shit because I know what this shit come with. So you can't be doing it. So I, I really can't even put my thought pattern in that. So I said, I'm going to just get the hell up out of here, and I'm going to start rapping. I want to listen to my damn self. So it was never for others to listen to. It just somehow everybody started tuning in. And once I started investing so much money in it, I said, shit, I got to become successful in this. Um, now, who was, like, the person that kind of inspired you to, to start pursuing it more so hardcore? World star. Really? The comments on World Star, they just, they just did me so wrong. Tell, talking about my voice real heavy, you know what I'm saying, and telling me I wasn't about that life, and telling me I ain't nothing, and just downgrading me, you know what I'm saying. When I throw up my first video with Young Scooter, and I was looking at them people, I was like, do they even know how many people I take care of? Do they know how many people I shot or? Where I come from, for real, like, I'm from prison, like, prison, I took over the whole compounds. I got a shootout with police. How could you disrespect me like that? Telling me I ain't about that life, I ain't sold no dope, I made $12 million. Oh, yeah, y'all gonna do me like that? So it's just, like, anything that, like, downed me, it made me stronger. It made me want to conquer. It made me want to go hard, you know what I'm saying? And that just... It just made me lose my temper tantrum and I was in the game. In the rap world, there's always like beefs and stuff like that. And you got into a beef with Rich Homie Kwan. Um, and you even admitted to like shooting at Young Thug. 
Oh yeah, that, yeah. I admitted to the shooting that y'all thug, but I never admitted to the shooting that um Rich Homie Yeah, no, no. But like you had a beef with him as yeah, far yeah, as you of course. know. Yeah, we had beef at um we had beef at a young age. You know what I'm saying? And things um things between him and I got real close. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Because um like I said, the jeweler by Elliot, Elliot um Aviana, he the one who sold me all this jewelry that I got. And um one day. He was with Young Thug, and I was at Young Thug. Nick, I just wasn't finna let the beef go. And he told, Young Thug told, and he was he was hot. Young Thug was hot, you know what I'm saying? He was who he is today, you know what I'm saying? He had stoner going out there when he lifestyle and stuff. So he need me, period. He was already getting $30,000 or $40,000 a show. So he told um, Elliot, I was jeweler, like, even if Rollo don't fuck with me, I fuck with him. He a real gangster. He deserve everything he got. And it kind of like stole my heart. So at that moment, I call everybody. I tell everybody to put guns down on Young Thug. You know what I'm saying? Because it was almost places that he couldn't go in Atlanta. You know what I'm saying? We were going to get him. But man, him and I, we became very close. Like He did the same thing for me that Young Scooter did. It's just he was able to give me more because he had more. You know mm -hmm. what I'm saying? He gave me better, bigger features, bigger looks. He gave me more money even when I was in the strip club and I ain't had money on me. He gave me ten, twenty thousand dollar ones to throw, you know what I'm saying? So I I love that by the death, you know what I'm saying? And what's your relationship now with Rich Homie? Uh well we standing there right now. I really um him and I really ain't got no beef right now, you know what I'm saying? I really ain't really stunned him, you know what I'm saying? My 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 ultimate thing was just telling cause us as rappers, like us as independent rappers or Drug dealers coming up because it's it's people that y'all never or the world never see. Like it's people in different country towns that pay dudes for features. Like they pay me for features and stuff like that. And like the rappers don't even know how serious like don't people take their money because I ain't have it like that to give future no twenty five thousand dollars. I had it, but I could have bought a car. I could have bought my girl some, my kids something. You know what I'm saying so. I, that money could have been spent on something else and. If Future would have like used my features towards something else, I would have felt some type of way about it. You know what I'm saying? That would happen with me and Richard McQuan. I never like I'm cool with his whole family. I'm cool with his sister Koi. I was cool with his homeboy, and things that matter. And I actually, when we went up there, I was just trying to talk to him. Like when we was at the arena, I didn't. I, I really wasn't pulling up on him to shoot him or nothing like that. Everywhere I go, I had guns. So when they seen guns, it went to the point where I was trying to like. Like kill him, he just was all the sudden uh, scared to come out. You know what I'm saying? But and I feel where he came from, cause I wouldn't come out if I know this nigga Rollo out here. He crazy and shout out these people he got choppers and stuff. But I really wanted to talk to him, like, like talk to me, bro. You know what I'm saying? Like I wouldn't even own no shit like that. You know what I'm saying? If it would have got to that point, if he would have did anything disrespectful, then of course I would have took things to the next level. But it was never my intention to come at him because. Actually, when they got the phone call leaked out on Facebook, my cameraman made a mistake and leaked that out. You know what I'm saying? He he ain't make a mistake. He just wanted to be so popular and he was dying for fame. He leaked that out. I didn't never even confront Rich on McCoy. He called me like, bro, why the hell you um, going on Disney 50 doing all that on like that, bro? Shit. I just want y'all, the world, to know how y'all rap niggas is. Y'all niggas ain't real as y'all say y'all lives on this music and y'all got diehard fans. And, like, I wanted to tell the fans in the world, like, this ain't really going on. You know what I'm saying? But I ain't, I ain't had a neck trying to kill him or nothing that shows the media, like, make it out to be. You know what I'm saying? I just wanted to show them, like, he ain't going to do that to me that he did to other people. I hate when people pray on the week because I seen him and other rappers go at people that went about their life and then had that going on and they was able to pray on the week. And I wanted to show him, like, I'm scrunkling him, you know what I'm saying? And, like, he ain't going to do that. You don't pray on the week, you know what I'm saying? I hate when people pick on people and bully people. Like, they just always, I was in prison. People used to just do little people wrong, take their food and stuff like that. And I just had to show them, like, he ain't going to do that to me. And I'm going to call him out and I'm going to say whatever I want to say and he ain't going to say nothing back. What's your upcoming projects? Uh, my upcoming project, I was gonna um drop a mixtape for my artists. Um, for America, I was trying to like show some love and like try to give back to my people and try to put them on the pedestal. And um, I was gonna drop them a mixtape, but um, things ain't going right with that situation. 
so I'm I might drop it if I can get some loyal artists that's really to go on the road and do these things like go to New York today, Alabama tomorrow, so Savannah sad like like I do. And people that, that people don't do that. Like mm -hmm. people is lazy, they don't wanna work and stuff like that. So if I was to do that, that would be my next upcoming project. But my up my next project by myself would be for American Gangster Part Two. And I would drop that on probably between February and April. Because Diary of the Streets Part 2 that just dropped, it's still bubbling real heavy, real, real, real heavy. And, like, I got, I got like, the world looking at me right now. So I don't want to kind of, like, overlook that project. I want to keep continuing. Just go ahead and get that out. But I got Gucci Man on my next project. I got um, Shy Glizzo, of course, Young Thug. I still got the same artist, you know what I'm saying, Lucci. Um, I'm going to try to get, um, like, all the OGs behind the wall, like Big Meech. I talked to them a lot. I talked to um, the dude, um, Zo, Zo, Zo Pound, Maka Zo. He was the leader of Zo Pound. I'm gonna get him on. I'm gonna get them kind of like to the host the whole project and Gucci Man so it can be a big project and try to give back to them.